Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii, on a sunny Monday, October 24th, 2022. I hope that everybody here likes grubbing in the soil, because that's exactly what we'll be talking about. Uh, Monique Schaefer, who I'll introduce momentarily, and I belong to the Hawaii State Energy Office, and our kuleana is 100% clean energy. That's the goal we started out articulating. Incidentally, we were the first state in the nation to articulate that goal. And then it became more and more and more sophisticated. And lately the buzzword is decarbonization. Get that gosh darn carbon or some of it out of the atmosphere and into other places like the soil because the CO2 carbon dioxide is serving as a blanket in our atmosphere and trapping the heat. And that's what global warming is all about. So how in the world do we extract or get carbon out of the atmosphere into the soil? That's what we're all about today. And before I bring on the star of the show, please uh, be introduced to Ms. Monique Schaefer of the Energy Office she is rapidly becoming Ms. Carbon of the Energy Office. She's already done quite a bit of work in the field, and this is going to expand her horizons. So welcome, Monique. Thank you for co-hosting with me. And now we bring on the grand star, Dr. Susan Crow of University of Hawaii, specialist in, it's not geophysics, it's geochemistry, and she has written a whole lot about improving the quality of soil. And that also includes bringing more nutrients and more carbon into the soil. We've got so much to talk about. Please, we're honored to have you, Dr. Crow. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Howard. And good to see you and meet you, Monique. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and share the, the carbon side of the story that comes from uh, biology, biogeochemistry. Don't forget the biology. Um, so happy to, to join natural and working lands um, and energy in the carbon conversation because to achieve decarbonization, um, it's all hands on deck and we need every component to be there. Dr. First question I forgot <laughs> to mention you are the recipient of a grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And is that grant for teeny little Hawaii $40 million? Well, 40 is a lot of millions. And yes, yes we were just announced as um, having received a USDA NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service grant, uh, for up to $40 million. Now we actually propose 70 million. That's how much interest there is for here. And even in our teeny tiny state um, that we had a proposal go in. So we have, we're in a kind of a holding pattern here, uh, waiting for that negotiation phase, but we're thrilled um, at the investment coming to Hawaii to, to, to study, um, make the investment in infrastructure markets specific to climate smart agriculture. Um, here on the islands. From there, um, yeah, what is climate smart? So climate smart agriculture is the focus of that grant. And so I'll just sort of use that um, as a way to kind of launch um, into this discussion here today. And what is climate smart anyway, really? Um, often the words describing agriculture thrown around that maybe people have heard are sustainable, regenerative, conservation, organic, and climate smart is just one of those um, options. They all have overlapping principles and practices and improving soil health as an outcome is one commonality across all of, um, across all of them. And so big picture players like Google even have recognized a regenerative agriculture play where adaptable, scalable um, agriculture, uh, and it emphasizes improvement uh, for everyone along a continuum of practices. And that's something that's really resonates here in Hawaii. And our University of Hawaii Soil Health Research Group also has been thinking along the same lines and developed parameters for our systems and soils here in Hawaii designed 
to assist managers to improve across the continuum of soils and ecosystems here in our islands. And so it's really consistent that soil health um, sort of is a central component. Often when I, when I launch into a soil health discussion, even when I've been asked to talk about carbon and climate, I'm asked, why are we bringing up soil health when we're discussing carbon and climate? And that is because of the connection, as you mentioned, through nutrients uh, and organic matter and carbon. And so the health of soil comes from biological, chemical, and physical properties that support diverse soil processes that are critical to productive and resilient, sustainable landscapes. Soil organic matter is central to soil health and carbon comprises about half of soil organic matter. And so, as you already mentioned, Howard, carbon is the currency of climate change. And so that's the connection. And for Hawaii, climate readiness is tied to both mitigation and adaptation and so soil health in my opinion, is central to the conversation. So soil carbon is part of that broader discussion um, because uh, soil carbon is a heterogeneous mixture of soil organic matter and minerals. So people don't always know soil is comprised of organic matter, which contains carbon and also minerals, and it's in a continuous state of turnover. So we need some of the carbon to turn over very quickly so that it releases nutrients. And sometimes that's tied more to the adaptation side of climate. Whereas the more mineral dominated co component of soil tends to cling on to carbon for a very long period of time. And so that stabilizes carbon against loss. And so often we think of that as the mitigation component. So in our lab, we can actually take whole soil and we fractionate it physically into multiple carbon pools. And then you can make measurements that give you some indication of how long that carbon may stay. So fast carbon may stay for a couple of years. We have intermediate amounts of carbon that may stay for 100, 130 years. And then that slow carbon pool may stay for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And this is why soil carbon is so important. So to get back to the climate change mitigation component, thinking about not just soil, but the whole ecosystem in all ecosystems, which are inclusive of all of the greenery that you can see above ground, but all of the stuff that you can't see below ground, uh, soil carbon capture, so using our natural systems to capture that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and get it below ground for long periods of time is the critical component. And so it depends not only on the amount of carbon, but how long those carbon inputs remain below ground. So that time frame is really critical. When I talk to the policy crowd, often this issue of how long does carbon stay below ground or permanence is something that comes up a lot. And so that aspect of time is something that's very important, fast versus slow, and also the vulnerability of that carbon that goes below ground to losses. And this is something that people um, see in fires, right, above ground, okay? But something like fire um, also affects the below ground, but maybe not as much. Because as you can see, fires come through and may devastate the above ground. Within days, a fire will go through, take out all of the above ground biomass, but because the roots and everything below ground remain intact, it can support a very rapid regeneration of those losses above ground. And so investing in trees sometimes can be thought of like volatile stocks. They come, they go, they're vulnerable. Cryptocurrency is another example, and the soil is your municipal bond, like kind of slow and steady, has ups and downs, but is there for you in the long term. Photosynthesis is that biochemical reaction that fixes carbon from the atmosphere. It can be shunted below ground into that root system and out into the soil where it binds with minerals. And soil contains more carbon than the atmosphere and plant biomass combined. And so that is why I focus on the potential for soil carbon to be a critical component in climate readiness and decarbonization in Hawaii. To detangle this challenge a little bit more, a colleague and I, Carlos Sierra at Max Planck in Germany, have started using Hawaii and Sweden 
um, as a good example of how two very, very different ecosystems can track sort of changes in the amount and transit time of carbon through not only the above ground system, but the soil system, the fast and slow pools represented by two boxes sometimes, and then the arrows between them. And by doing this side-by-side -side comparison of what people know to be very different, right? Tropical perennial grasses in uh, biofuel forage or feedstock here in Hawaii versus boreal cold and temperate in Sweden, very, very different. And so if you think about one unit of carbon coming into those very different systems and moving through on a 20 year time period, we actually found that about the same amount of carbon sequestration occurs. Uh, when you don't think just about one unit of carbon, but we have higher productivity here in Hawaii. And so over longer periods of time based on actual productivity, you can see that Hawaii's system sequestered more carbon about twice as much on a 20 year time frame. So very different systems. Okay, but carbon sequestration is just an amount of carbon over time. It's not actually directly comparable to warming. So how do you make that connection between carbon sequestration in soil and systems and actual warming? And that's the trick. And so the cool thing is that you can think about how our natural systems and our agronomic systems can interact with the climate system, not only in an ecosystem sense, but also in a complex food and energy sense, because now you can compare one unit of emission and the warming it causes to a unit of sequestration and the warming benefit therein. We can stop here and take questions if you want. We have a couple more bigger picture, but I know Monique is dying to, ju <laughs> to jump in. So why don't you guys go ahead and, go, and we can go, go, go through. for it, Monique. <laughs> yeah, super fascinating. Thank you, Dr. Crow. Um, so as you know, right now, the state inventory, it indicates that the ag, the forestry, and land use sectors are right now a net sink um, for carbon dioxide. Is there a chance that this sector could switch and become a source in the future? And if so, you know, how do we preserve that sink moving forward? Yeah, there's been a lot of conversation and, and kind of dire warning about the forest within that sector, right? Currently being a sink and potentially becoming a source. And that's because of the vulnerability that they're facing to wildfires. In other places more than here, deforestation and also the warming of itself as, as the climate warms, decomposition increases. And so that can ultimately you know, increase those fluxes to the point where you're losing more carbon than you're actually fi fixing and stabilizing through um, through photosynthesis. And, and so there is a there is that risk, right? And a big one here is also uh, invasive species. So that just contributes to sort of the degradation of that carbon cycle um, in a in a healthy, undisturbed system, unaffected system that will remain a sink. Now our agricultural lands in particular with an intensive land use history are already considered through that inventory analysis sources. But currently we have very, very little intensive agriculture on a large scale because of the collapse of plantation style agriculture. And so one of the areas where we have a lot of potential benefit is in altering the trajectory of those ecosystems. We know there are ways that we as humans can make decisions to care for the land to make sure that they not only stop becoming sources, but can, can become sinks um, over time. That's awesome. That's so great to hear. Thank you. Thanks. And so if we want to continue on, Howard, unless you have a question sure. as well, we can continue. Yeah. So the issue that I talk um, a lot about here in Hawaii is stop, stop warming, right? And preserve the environment for our future generations. And that really centers a lot of the conversations with the energy office and with policy makers. Um, and so that absolute global warming potential of CO2 is much larger for emissions than sequestration. Emissions reduction remains paramount, right? We never want to dis distract 
um, from reducing emissions as far as we possibly can. But where this sector can come in and nature-based solutions and natural working lands can fill the gap is where we run out of those low-hanging fruits within the energy and transportation sectors. There will always be remnant, non-renewable, unavoidable, non-renewable emissions, right? And so what we can do is help prioritize actions on our landscape that actually do have a climate benefit that are close to or on par on a per unit basis of emissions. And that's how we can start with this new computation of the climate benef benefit of sequestration in the same units um, as the warming from emissions. Now we can start working through some of our options to figure out some of those lowest hanging fruits for highest impact. And so one unit of carbon emission was about an order of magnitude greater in those example soil systems, just to kind of give it um, a, a platform. Um, but we can think about how to choose climate actions within this sector that gets it up to approximately the same order of magnitude. And Hawaii has some really, really key characteristics that allow us to sort of set the, the bar equal um, within an energy or food system um, to think about what actions we can take where we actually get a warming benefit um, on par with uh, emissions avoidance. And that's how we're assessing are really, really high impact projects. And so we have high productivity as we talked through in the last example. We have deep soils that can store carbon for very long amounts of time. We have large areas of degraded soils that are available in that post-intensive agricultural period, right? So that's a low hanging fruit because we can target those um, currently you know, non-active, non-productive lands that have been degraded in the recent past. We also have volcanic ash soils, which has an extraordinarily high capacity to store carbon and keep it there for very long periods of time. And so we have a lot of interest as well as evidenced by that $70 million proposal we just put in with 50 plus producers coming to the table across all of the natural and working lands, agricultural sectors, forests, ranching, agroforestry, and food production, who said, we're ready to implement management strategies that will maximize our, our climate benefit. And so what we can do is target projects that protect and restore high carbon ecosystems, incentivize agricultural practices that provide direct warming mit mitigation and avoid emissions. And so by this computational structure allows us to make that calculation together, right? Now, not just warming benefit from direct sequestration and GHG emissions avoidance, but also within that like imports of fossil-based fertilizer, importing food, okay? And also a key thing is diverting waste streams. Anytime you can take some aspect of our circular economy that would go into a landfill and trap it and stabilize it or convert it into a uh, soil amendment such as compost or biochar that would then go back into our agricultural landscapes, that's where we're going to have maximized climate benefits as a result of what we invest in here um, in Hawaii. And so when I talk to people about what those critical component of climate solutions portfolio might be, you know, it's really across these areas, right? Providing quantifiable warming, warming mitigation and co-benefits to the environment. So back to soil health, right? Carbon that comes along with building uh, climate smart agriculture will also build health and resilience into landscapes through building health um, into our soils. And so a key component of sustainable food and energy systems is a component of restoration of these biocultural landscapes. And any given initiative put forward is only one component of a larger integrated approach. And that's where hooking up with you folks in the energy office and talking about decarbon decarbonization in conversations like that is, is so critical. 
um, the main thing we want to do is tear down barriers for people implementing these climate smart agricultural practices in the context of much broader decarbonization uh, conversations, because it's going to take an entire portfolio to achieve decarbonization. Wow, you've just given us a whole semester's worth of uh, work here <laughs> in uh, 20 minutes, doctor. Uh, I know Monique is bursting with questions, but let me ask some more down to earth type questions. You apparently have 50 partners in this endeavor in little old Hawaii. You have located <laughs> 50 people or 50 organizations to or in farmers, ranchers, whatever. Yeah, we actually have more than 50. I mean, the list is amazing. What the 50 was, was just at the proposal phase, which was a very rapid phase. These are 50 plus farmers, ranchers, producers. So not the producer organizations, not the universities that pitched in, not the agencies, just the producers who came together and pulled like a fully developed um, budget and project that they are ready to implement within the first year. Now, we know that we didn't reach everybody who has interest, right? So we actually built into our proposal a second phase where we reach more people. We know there are more people out there. Um, and so we built that into the proposal. Uh, but just at the proposal stage, over 50, isn't that incredible in little Hawaii? <laughs> that is truly incredible. Can you just briefly list the type of, who are these uh, 50 plus entities out there? They're just in, in groups. Yeah, so we took the approach um, for this proposal, very different than other than other places. We took the approach of doing this for the, for the good of Hawaii to achieve Hawaii at the state levels, uh, decarbonization and climate goals. And so we wanted to build a diverse portfolio of projects. And so we very actively um, sought people across the agricultural sector defined very broadly as inclusive of forest projects. So we have foresters who are interested in large scale co coa reforestation. We have ranchers who are some of, some of whom are already doing great work and who have you know, neighbors and partners who are interested in implementing some of the same practices that they've seen um, our ranching students Stewards. So those are diversified uh, uh, forage, improved forage, uh, fencing projects to keep out those invasive species and keep in, keep, keep out the, the animals that they don't want, keep in the animals they do want, silvopasture. We also have agroforestry and we have all kinds of crop production across the board, all of the things that we can grow here in Hawaii. People don't even realize how many people are growing things, how many people want to grow a diversity of crops. And so there's a whole list of food producers um, who signed on for big and small projects alike. Well, and as you point out, this is gonna result in more local food production, mm -hmm. which equals more jobs, mm -hmm. and maybe not the best paying jobs in the world, but the, these people are doing what they love doing. Plus that will result in fresher produce for us. The fresher, the better, the higher the nutrient uh, content. And question, something we are looking at is, I think it's called solar farming, mm -hmm. where you put up solar panels, say eight or 10, 10 feet above the ground, and then you free on agricultural land. And then the crops that don't need much sun at all are grown under that. Have you looked into that at all? I've thought about it and, and really it goes to that principle of anything that compounds all of these climate benefits. And I love that one because it crosses directly the energy and food production you know, sectors. And so that's just another area as a perfect example of how this computational structure can actually put your emissions avoidance um, together in the same computational structure. And so you, as the, as the carbon sequestration and food production, right? So you layer on all of those added climate benefits to a full view of, of what uh, warming mitigation you're actually achieving within that, within that production system. And final question, then I'll turn it over to Monique. It sounds like little old Hawaii is a petri dish for this type of research. So as you are progressing, you are publishing in national and international journals? 
Yes, yeah, that's the idea. So instead of a Petri dish, I like to think of it as a model system, as like a perfect example um, of how we can implement these practices, use this computational structure, and people are, are watching, right, all across the world to see how you can better account for carbon and better compute the warming benefits that you actually achieve, achieve. and I think Hawaii is in a great position to, to be an exemplar of, of alternative ways to do it that have meaningful um, benefits to it, to the, the climate system. Wow. And finally, it sounds like this is also exciting that it may convince young people to stay in Hawaii and do good work instead of tootling off to uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a lot of training opportunities in this, right? And these can't, they don't have to be low paying jobs, right? So there's a tech side to this. It's data rich that we have the need, you know, for people to make the measurements and to, to reach out into the community. And so there's a lot of opportunity for diversified, um, I, you know, workforce and high tech training to feed into these market systems and verification of climate benefits. And that's all part of this big grant is, is to make sure that this um, these actions can be sustained beyond the life of, of the project and through our young people and educational pathways and building up um, these tech, you know, driven sectors uh, that can help people really regain that uh, relationship uh, to the land, to the earth here in Hawaii and benefit all of us is is definitely a big uh, picture goal of the project. Yeah, so, sounds like it's going to lend itself to tours. Young, young people <laughs> of all stripes too, when, when the time is ready. But Maybe. we have just a couple of minutes and Monique is just about to explode <laughs> with more questions. Thanks, Howard. Um, yeah, so if you're open to it, uh, you talk market. And one of the big questions I always have is how do we make it sustainable um, from an economic perspective? Um, I would love to get some of your thoughts on sort of carbon credit and offset market. What are the benefits? What are the concerns? And is there a way to do, any, do it meaningfully here in Hawaii? Yeah, that is that is an area you know of, of great of great conversation and debate. And so, you know, for me, what what I would like to see is the formation of some form of local market. Um, you know, entering into a market offset market certainly financially benefits the the holder of those resources, because this is a, a resource, right? The 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 carbon is not a commodity per se in our grant, but carbon as a commodity is what you can then trade in, into a market. And so I know that there's a desire for that. And so if somebody wants to enter into that financial transaction, then that's good, then that's good, right? And we need a buyer. And my preference would be that that buyer would be available locally. And right now there is no form of Hawaii-based carbon market. And so to me, if we want to keep um, our carbon and all the benefits, the climate benefits that are quantifiable and come along with that for us to use here in Hawaii towards our decarbonization goals, then there has to be a local market so that people have access to that financial benefit that comes via a market. If we sell Hawaii's carbon resources to polluters off island, then you can't double dip on accounting for that climate value when it comes time for us here in Hawaii to start thinking about whether we've achieved decarbonization. And so that's where my brain kind of goes and I don't have a solution, but, but definitely an area of active conversation. Well, if I know Monique, she's going to follow up on this. <laughs> I hope she does. <laughs> and we don't have, haven't been given a time warning, but uh, my clock on the wall says we're just about to wrap up uh, Monique any short sweet simple question to to bring us on our way oh the pressure's on I I think I'm done with short <laughs> simple sweet questions it's a very complex topic and I think it deserves a lot more attention so thank you Dr. Crow yeah okay. thank you for tackling uh, the complexity yeah well I have on my calendar Doctor, about a year from now, going to reinvite you because by then so much will have occurred. 
this is just just incredible and you may be able to bring some of your co-conspirators on board also to mm -hmm. describe what they are doing this is exciting stuff doctor and on that very cheery note we must bid fond adieu to code green think tech hawaii october 24 2002 too. thank you audience this will be archived if you have questions please feed them in and we'll see you in two weeks aloha Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.